Okay, so we got the projector back up. I knew it worked this morning, but it is what it is. Uh, today you have exercise 208. Uh, we're going to depart from Rhino for a second in back into the world of V-Ray. And like I said, we're going to flip-flop back and forth, Rhino to V-Ray, etc. Uh, part of the reason that I keep flip-flopping is because you guys keep wanting to know more about, wait, I want it to look better. So we're going to keep flipping back and forth. Um, today we're going to talk about something called texture mapping of objects. Uh, and basically that is how when I have a material, let's say I have brick or I have uh, you know siding or something, how do I control what it looks like and how the texture is actually applied to the object? Uh, and that's kind of a large part of what we're, we're, what we're doing when we're rendering is deciding how the material is going to be applied, what scale is the material, how much does it repeat, and, and that sort of thing. So we're going to work through that today um, in your uh, Rhino file. What I've asked you to do to start in part one is we're going to create a, a bunch of objects uh, and I'm going to do it live so that you guys can hopefully do it with me um, and then we'll go through and kind of explore the texture mapping options. After that, when we get to uh, parts, uh, let me just see here, part three and part four, um, you're going to be working with the files that you created last class. Um, and so you'll go through and kind of do some operations that I ask you to do on those, including texture mapping those objects and then bringing them in as a block, uh, etc. So um, for now, uh, let's get started on the texture mapping part. Uh, I've asked you to create a variety of primitive shapes. One shape that I want is something that looks an awful lot like a wall. So I, I think I asked you to do it at 12 feet uh, by 1 foot by 8 feet, I think. I, yeah, something like that. So there's a wall here. Um, let's go ahead and view this in shaded mode so that we can see. Yep, there it is. Uh, and let's create a few more objects. Right? We'll do. Uh, yeah. And I did that about four by four. That's that's the size category. We I, I want you to get used to applying materials to uh, objects that are the size of the things that you'll be doing. Right, pieces of furniture, large objects. It's very rare that you're going to be modeling, say, you know, this remote control and have to do the the texture mapping on that. If you if you Google uh, texture mapping in Rhino, a lot of times you'll find people doing this kind of texture mapping. It's really too fine of a detail for what we're going to be doing. We need the larger picture stuff, uh, and so we're going to go through that. Let's do a few others. Let's do like a cylinder. Uh, I don't know. And we'll do maybe a cone. That's a really ugly cone. Something like that. Uh, and let's do a sphere too. Okay, so right now the sphere is below the, the ground, so I'm going to move it up. So I'm doing move and then V for vertical, and we'll go up. I did it um, at six feet in diameter, so I'll move it up three so that it's sitting right on, on the ground itself. Okay, so I have these objects that are ready um, that we're going to start working on the rendering of. But before I do that, I want to set up a few kind of basic things so that I can use them in this rendering. First thing that I'll do is set up an infinite plane. So I'll come over here to infinite plane, and I'll just click on the infinite plane icon, and I should get an infinite plane below my objects, which is exactly what I wanted. Um, I'm not overly worried about transparency today because we're not really going to be doing glass. So the fact that they intersect the infinite plane, these objects, it's not the end of the world. If they were transparent, I might need to adjust a little bit. So I have that in place. And then the last thing is I want uh, a directional light so we have a little bit of shadow uh, in this scene. So as I've done before, I'm going to create a little bit of a helper object um, to do my directional light, which is right here. And I'm going to snap from this point to that point so that my directional light is going down kind of on an angle. Right? Something like that. So now I'll zoom in a little bit. And maybe I will select all except for the background, the infinite plane. And then zoom selected that I have easily viewed in my scene. Okay, so 
Now, as I start to apply these, I'm gonna use the same texture over and over again. I would encourage you to play around with different textures um, because how they tile is gonna vary and it's gonna help you learn more. But for the uh, purposes of illustration, I wanna use the same one. Uh, it doesn't matter which tile I pick, I just want there to be something where it's a, it's a good repeating pattern uh, that will help you uh, see what's going on. So when I go to my materials here, I'm gonna go ahead and load a material, and I already loaded a brick uh, material, but that'll work fine as a repeating pattern. Sometimes I do planks, today I'll do bricks, it's just variety. Uh, I'll right click, say load material, and you can pick whatever material uh, works for you. I think in the past I've done one of these, I think it might be this one. No, it's not that one, but it's same same thing would work fine. It doesn't really matter which one you use. I'm going to go ahead and do the red brick um, as my primary material. And what, I, what I'm going to do is either assign this to the individual objects or assign it to the layer. It really doesn't matter. And so I'll do some of each. Uh, let's take a few of these objects. We'll take these objects. And I'm going to go to layers, and I'm going to make each of those on layer one. So we'll change object layer. And I'm doing this both ways so that you get... Uh, the diversity of how you might apply the material and the fact that texture mapping is not connected to how you apply the material. So I have some shapes on layer one, the rest of them are on layer zero. I am gonna put my infinite plane on its own layer and we'll call the infinite plane uh, IP. And I think I accidentally created a couple infinite planes. Let's get rid of those extras. Uh, and what I can do with the infinite plane layer is I can lock it so that it just kind of exists in the background. Uh, I'm not going to apply any material to it. I'm going to leave it uh, as its basic setting. So if right now I were to go ahead and render this, right, we'd end up with kind of a white object. We have a little bit of shadowing on that, but no materials have been applied yet. Okay. So let's go ahead and apply some materials. On the cylinder here and the wall, I'm going to go ahead and apply the materials by the object. So I'll click on the cylinder, I'll right click on my material, and I'll say M apply material to selection. Likewise, I'll come over here, click on this object, go to my material editor, and right click and say apply material to selection. Okay. Now these three objects are all on layer one, so instead of applying it to the objects individually, I'm going to go ahead and apply it to the layer as a whole. Uh, so if I look over here at layer one, right next to the color, there's a faint little white circle. If I click on that, it will let me pick the material here. The basic default material is, is what it comes up as. I want to assign it by a V-Ray plugin. So I'm going to check the box for V-Ray. Then I'll click Browse, and I'll pick my brick. I'll say OK, and I'll say OK. And you'll see that the material will now be listed here. It's brick as the material. So, if I were to go ahead and render now, maybe, come on, okay, notice that the material has been applied to all of my objects, right? These were assigned, these two were assigned by the objects themselves, these three were assigned by layer. Doesn't matter which way I do it, long term you're probably going to want to assign by layer because you're going to have hundreds of thousands of objects and it gets a little bit daunting to just assign by object uh, and to try to find the object, but it varies a little bit. So if we look at these objects, uh, I'd say let's concentrate on the wall first or maybe the, uh, the, the cube might be a good place to start. Um, we're, we don't have kind of even texture mapping. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the rest of these objects for a second and I'm going to type hide just to make them go away. I'll show them, I'll, I'll show them up uh, a little bit and I'm going to zoom in on just this object so that we're focusing. You don't have to hide your object. I just wanted to do it to clarify what's going on. So if I go back and I re-render this, we have a cube. And by default, we can kind of see that my um, texture wraps around the cube, which is not bad, and then there's been a lid applied. Okay? If I want to change how this is applied, I'm going to select the object, and I'm going to go to this properties window. Okay? 
And on the properties window, we have the basic object properties, which is the little colored circle here. Next to it, we have the material properties. And so if we look at it, it says assign material by layer. Right? That's how we assign this material. That's fine. Notice that it does have a match button. Sometimes if you need an object and you need the material to match, it's quicker to do a match. Right? And then the last one here is something called texture mapping. And that's what we're going to deal with today. Uh, and it looks like kind of a checker pattern on a half a cylinder. Okay? And so if I click on that, we see that there is nothing showing up down here, which means that there has been no default, there's no ma mapping applied, it's just the default, right? however it was mapping. So if we look up here, we have a variety of preset mapping strategy. We have something called unwrap, we have something that's called custom mapping, and then we have a bunch of these black and white ones. Surface mapping, planar mapping, box mapping, sphere mapping, uh, and cylindrical mapping. Okay? Generally, most of your objects will fit in one of these black and white preset objects. That's what we're going to try to use to the best of our abilities. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on, this looks like a box to me, so I'm going to pick on the box mapping. And when I say apply box mapping, I haven't finished the command yet. Notice that it changes, right, what's over here. But if I look at my command line, it says first corner of the base, or I can just pick a bounding box. And the bounding box is usually the fastest way of doing it. So I'll go ahead and click bounding box, right? Coordinate system, world is the default. I usually stick with world, right? Do I want there to be a cap on it? Do I want there to be a top on this? Yes, I do. So we'll click yes, okay? And now it's done that. And if we look back over in our properties, again in our texture mapping, where before we just had the mapping presets, now we've got a bunch of information here, okay? So we can tell that the type of mapping that's been applied is box. The projection method is closest point. Uh, and the texture place is single, the texture space is single. You will probably not mess with any of these settings, right? Likewise, the X, Y, Z position, you will very unlikely need to change. On rare instances, you may need to rotate if the, the material is being applied the wrong direction, you will rotate one of those values, and I'll show you an example there. And then under X, Y, Z size, right now, this is coming as the size of my object. So I, this is a four foot by four foot by four foot square, so it's applying one panel, right, one brick panel to each of that 48 by 48 by 48. And I'm going to do a quick little illustration on the board to help you see this, okay? So I have my texture that looks like brick. Right, something like that that looks like brick. This, right, and this are set in like Photoshop or something, okay? It's my standard pattern. This would repeat itself, right, as many times as I want it tiling outward. Make sense? Okay? So, when I apply this mapping, let me find an eraser. Oh, sorry. <laughs> when I apply this mapping to a box, Right? It's going to take this image, right, and it's going to project it there, it's going to project it there, and it's going to project it there. Make sense? Okay? So, in this value here, which is right, there we go, right here, 48, 48, 48, it's saying what is the size of this texture, right? Mm -hmm. Right now, this texture, this is 48 inches, right, and this is 48 inches. Okay. If I want to change that, I can change that value. Let's say that I change it to, well, before I do that, let me also switch my uh, mode here into rendered mode so that we can see a preview of what the object looks like. Okay. It just helps in the visualization here. Okay. If I change this from 48 to 24, right? I have to change each one of them, sorry, 24, 24. See how the, the, the pattern gets smaller, right? It's saying that what my texture is that used to be 48 by 48, make it 24 by 24. So I end up with four of these on one of the faces rather than just one of them on the faces, right? So I can keep that going down and down and down, right? I could say that, oh, I, you know, I wanted it, instead of being 24, I wanted it to be 12, 12, and 12, right? And we get a much smaller pattern. This is probably too small, okay? It's 
jump back up. There are a couple presets here. We have x equals y equals z, which will just equalize them all. Uh, this will go back to the size of your object, and this will go to one to one to one. Right, one inch by one inch by one inch, which is really, really tiny usually, not what you're going to ultimately pick. So I'll go back to 48 by 48 for right now. Right? And if we look at this in its rendered form, I'm going to go ahead and render it out. You'll see that the box mapping is designed so that we get a continuous texture that wraps around the corner of the object and it also wraps up and onto the top of the object. Now being that it's a box, we obviously can't wrap in four directions at once on a repeating pattern like this. Right? So somewhere there will have to be a seam. Right? In that case it's right here along that edge. Okay, so let's leave this for right now. Um, and I'm going to show the rest of my objects and we'll work with, say, the sphere. Right? So let me go ahead and hide these. And again, I'm just showing and hiding them to clarify as we work through it what's going on. So if we go, um, if we select the object and we come here, once again, I don't have any texture mapping applied. So I'm going to apply the closest shape to my object, closest shape being a sphere. So we'll go ahead and apply that. Again, I can specify a center of sphere or I can just click a bounding box. The bounding box is almost always the easiest way. Coordinate system is again going to be world, right? And it's now created my little sphere. So if we look here, the, the diameter of my sphere was 72 inches, right? So it's taking one of those texture panels and stretching it over that 72 inches. So if I wanted to change that value, um, you know, let's say 24, 24, and 24, oops. Right, we could make it a little bit smaller. Did that change at all? No, it didn't. Oh, nice. uh, okay, so because this is a sphere, we're going to change this slightly how we do it. Uh, we also have the ability right here to UVW repeat. Right, and this is helpful um, because we can get more tiling out of a particular piece. Um, it's really subjective, there's no math associated here, you're just going to change the value and see what happens. If I go to, uh, generally if you lock it, it's helpful um, because you don't have to type it three times. If I go to 2.0, we see that we get more repetition of pattern. If I get 3.0, we get more, right? And so in this spherical orientation, right, you see that it's stretched it, right, over the sphere and it gets tighter at the top, right, larger in the center but it generally maps all the way around the object. So if you're doing a spherical object, it's likely that you're going to want to pick something uh, along this line. And if we go to rotate it, we'll get similar results out of it. Or excuse me, if we go to render it. You can see how it applies there at the center. Okay, so let's move on, right, and we'll go to the cylindrical object here. Let me hide these guys. All right, so now we've got something that's a little bit more challenging because it has a cap on it and it's also wrapping go to apply this one, right? Once again, I'm coming over to my texture mapping. It most closely matches the cylindrical mapping, so we'll go ahead and do cylindrical mapping, right? Again, we'll come up here and look. It's going to be bounding box. That's what we want, right? Coordinate system is world. Yes, I want it capped, right? And we can see that it changed it a little bit, right? So now it's a matter of making some adjustments. Now, notice in this, we have different values here. We have 60, 60, and 120. That's because it's five feet across, but 10 feet tall, right? So there's a different orientation here. We can adjust the global repeat of the pattern um, by just upping this value. And you can see that it, it changes both the top and the sides. 
Notice though that the top is getting narrower than the sides going up and down. So in reality, we may want to go back and change this value to match. So if we go to 60, that was not what I wanted to do. Let's unlock it and let's repeat the Z value here. Really? Yeah, I did pick the cat. Why is it not changing? I think you may understand the cat as a different property separated from the other. No, they're they're tied together. It's just not updating, I think. Very, very difficult. All right, well, this one's being a little bit difficult, but we're getting decent size um, rendering on the side here. I'm going to get to the ability to custom map some of it. Um, and so the preset's not letting me adjust that as well as I would like. Um, but I do have that done now. Let's move on to the wall. So let me show, and then we'll come back to the wall here. That's the one I'm going to work with. And let's zoom selected. All right. So now on the wall, right, we've, we've moved away from the, the standard shapes. But generally, the wall is roughly a box, right? It's still somewhat box-like. So we're going to go ahead and apply the box mapping to it. And um, we're going to pick bounding box again. We're going to pick world again. And we're going to pick, pick capped, yes. Okay. And it's now created our general box mapping. But if I look at this, right, I've got a much broader texture on the face than I do at the top here. Right. And so I keep, sorry, my mouse is sticking and I keep right clicking. Uh, if I look at this, we've got 144, 12, and 96, right? If I go to x equals y equals z, however, right? I'm sorry that I keep right clicking. It's not helping things. Um, we can see that our texture map, right, scale wise matches up quite nicely. So let's jump to the UVW repeat and increase that value. Uh, let's go. Try two. See? And it's still probably a little bit. Let's try three. And it's starting to look pretty good as a brick wall. It might be 3.5. And again, one of the things about texture mapping is there's not an absolute science to it. right? You have to do a little trial and error. You have to preview it. You have to see what looks about right for the scale of what you're trying to um, create. Okay. So once again, that wraps nicely. This will wrap around the end of the wall right very well right and it will wrap across the top there but not on this side so we see there's the seam so the same thing happened with the box whether it was a wall um, or the actual object itself okay so then we get to the more complicated objects like the cone here okay. so let me take these and turn them off Okay, and so we have the cone, and we could apply one of these, like a cylindrical map to it, it's kind of close, it might be okay, but in reality, it's, it's unlikely that we're going to get that good of results. This is going to involve a little bit more custom um, work on, in terms of how we, how we go ahead and map it. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to use something called an unwrap uh, in its texture mapping, uh, which is right here, and when I click on it, it's going to say select seams, okay? And what I need is I need there to be a seam, right, both here and somewhere along the side of the cylinder. Unfortunately, I don't have one yet, so I'm going to go ahead and draw one that goes down one side. Let me turn on quadrant. Good. All right, and let me go back to my mapping here. 
I'm going to go to unwrap, select seams. I'm going to pick that, both the circle at the bottom here, uh, and also this line that I did as a diagonal. I'll go ahead and hit enter. Right. Okay, so it now unwrapped the coordinates for me. That's good, but I need to be able to see it. And so next to, I have another option here, which is called the UV editor. Uh, and I'm going to click on the UV editor, and I'm going to draw next to my object kind of a large rectangle. Right? And when I do that, it's going to show me the unwrapped objects. Right? So if we think about a cylinder, if we were to cut it out and try to make it, we'd end up with a fan-shaped object like this, and we'd end up with a circle object for the bottom. Okay? So I have those two pieces. Unfortunately, I'm not seeing what the texture looks like. Let me switch to shaded mode to see if it's going to show me anything more. No, we're going to stay in rendered mode. What I can do, however, right, is I can show the texture. So I'll come over here under UV Editor. This should show up when you create it. Uh, and I'm going to use a texture. And this, I have to go find it. Uh, and this is a little bit annoying. Um, I could use just a, a grid texture, but I'm instead going to go find the actual brick texture. So let me jump to uh, my textures here. And I'm going to pick this as my texture. And I'll use that. I'll say OK. Good. And we'll click Apply. Oops. Did a really bad job of doing it. Why is it not showing it the way it's supposed to? You've got to love this. You know, you do this over and over again, and then you end up with something like this where it doesn't work. All right, let's do, let's cancel that, and I'll try to do a complete custom mapping and see if it'll show me. I'm going to delete this mapping there so that I no longer have it. And then we'll do a custom, completely custom map and see if it'll let me do it that way. No? No. So helpful if it did what it was supposed to. That's fine. All right. Well, I apologize because this is completely not working. Try it one more time and see if I can get it to work. So bizarre. See, it, it's giving me a grid, which is what I want, but it's not showing it should have a matching grid over here that lets me adjust my pieces to match. And I don't know why it's not doing it. Yeah, we'll try it and see. Uh, uh, brilliant. Thank you. Okay, so let me go back to 
I want to use my grid, thank you, perfect. Okay, so what I end up with, right, is an object that represents both the bottom and the cone itself, right? And now, if I move this object, right, the texture of this object will change. Likewise, if I scale this object, so let me scale it down, right, the matching texture here will change. And so I have a lot more control over my objects. Uh, let me scale, make this bigger. Right. And if we look at the object, see how it's matching? Likewise, if I rotate it, like that, my texture will rotate as well. Let's try it with a pyramid. You might be able to see it a little bit better. So let me go ahead and apply the material. I'm going to do it as the boards so that you might be able to see it a little bit better on the screen. Okay, so there's my boards, right? I want to change how this material is applied. So I will go to my material editor. Oh, we have to click apply. Okay. Uh, and now I'm going to do an unwrap, right? And I'm going to say I want that edge and I want a seam that goes along here like that. I'll go ahead and hit enter and then I'm going to use my UV editor to draw a box where I'm going to see, sorry right now it's the brick I need to switch to the other material here. So what I'm going to be able to do is I'm going to see, this is my unfolded cutout object. I can see how the material is being applied to it. Right? And if we look at it there, see how we can see it's wrapping around the object. Right? If I wanted it to, let me go ahead and rotate this object. Right? Let's say I want, turn off ortho for a second. I wanted it to be more perpendicular to this side and then wrap around the object that way. We can see that there it is on the perpendicular side. Right? and then it wraps around the rest of my sphere, or excuse me, the rest of my pyramid, the same way it's showing up here. So I have a lot more flexibility with how these things are applied. If I wanted it to wrap down and under the object, right, I could take this and I could rotate this more like this, right? And then let me scale it slightly, so it'll fit. That. And let me rotate it a little bit more. That. Right. And now if we come over here and we look at this edge, it's in the shadow unfortunately, and then we go and look at the bottom, which is all conveniently in the shadow, right? the lines would go straight down this and wrap around the bottom. So I have a lot of flexibility in terms of how this is custom applying to my particular material uh, based on these individual pieces. Furthermore, I could break this into more pieces by selecting more seams. Uh, and then I'd have control over each individual piece. Okay, So this is a, about as custom as it gets. There are, however, some other options that can help us uh, as we explore these shapes. So let me go ahead and click Apply for a second. Sorry, I have to finish and Apply. And let me show the rest of my objects. And we can get rid of this giant pyramid. Okay. Sometimes you want to be able to work with the object um, and manipulate it. Like let's say on this particular object, the cube, we wanted to rotate what side uh, the bricks are on. Okay? We can go select the object and we can come over here to the show mapping button. And when we click on the show mapping, we get basically a little grid uh, of yellow shapes. And we can manipulate that the same way we would manipulate any of the regular objects. So, for example, I could choose to rotate it. And I could rotate it from here 
to there, and you can see that it's changing, right, the way the materials are applied. Now, unfortunately, I'm rotating this, right, to where it's going out of the center of the object. So I really need to rotate it around the center. Which brings uh, another thing that you can use, and this is the one place that I will use it. Um, I don't particularly like it um, because I think it can screw you up in a lot of ways. But it's something called the gumball, and some of you have already turned it on, some of you have discovered it, some of you really like it, some of us don't. Um, but if I click on gumball, it'll give me this kind of weird red, green, and blue icon. Do you see that show up in the center there? It shows up in the center of my object, right? And it stays the same size whether I zoom in or zoom out. Uh, and what it does is it give, gives me some ability to move and or rotate this particular object. So if I were to click and drag on the object, right, it would allow me to rotate right in this direction, right, depending on how I wanted to rotate. Furthermore, right, I can move by clicking and dragging, and we could get adjustments in my texture. Right? I could rotate in one of the other directions right, and get different adjustments. So the point is it can get a little um, screwy. The point is you can, you can play around with these kinds of adjustments to get the desired results. And I'm doing that using the show mapping icon. Okay? The cube might not be the best place to do it. You can see here that I rotated it so that the brick pattern is going diagonally. Right? But that shows you that you have the flexibility on any object to change how the mapping is being applied to that particular object, right? And it doesn't it doesn't wrap particularly well on the ends here anymore, but I'm getting a good result on that particular piece. The other thing that's worth showing you is that if we had I'm going to move over here, turn off these guys for a second. Okay, if I had let's say I have an object here, it looks like a wall, right? And I copy this object and I put it here and one more right there. Take this one, rotate. There, right? I'm basically creating a little mini building, so to speak. Right? If I have these objects and I want to apply texture to these as a whole, Right? If I select all of the objects at once, right, and then go to my texture mapping, right, and apply a box mapping to the whole thing. The bounding box, world, yes. Right? The texture will be applied to all of them. I need to actually assign the material here. Let me go ahead and apply material to selection. There we go. Right? The texture will then work as a seam all the way across all of the objects. So if we look at this back side here. Right, and let me go ahead and um, adjust these up a little bit. A little smaller. Right? If I look across the back side of those, even though they are distinctly separate objects, there and there, right, the texture flows across them seamlessly. Okay? So when you get to a point where you have a building Right, where you might have a doorway cut out, you might have a piece that you patched in above the door. As long as you apply the texture mapping to all of the objects across, you'll get a seamless texture that flows through. Okay? Sometimes you have one object that doesn't have the correct mapping applied to it, but you have some objects that do. Right? Great opportunity to match mapping. So if we select um, the object, Sorry, my mouse is very touchy on the right click. If I select the object, there is the ability here to match mapping. It's going to say select source object. I can pick that as my source object. And now the mapping on this object will match the mapping on that object. Does that kind of make sense? So once you dial it in, it's very easy to copy this mapping across. The other thing that you can do is you can have different texture on the inside and the outside. Right, right now it's being applied because these are whole objects. If I were to explode right, I could take these objects 
and I could change the material on these objects. Right? And so I could have the inside be a completely different material than the outside. Does that make sense? Right? Likewise, these still flow around the corner and would match up quite nicely uh, in a render. If I were to go ahead and render. Okay. So this, these are the basics of texture mapping. You will find that as you continue to explore, you'll run across sticky points. When you do, let's talk through them. Um, but this should at least give you the, the basis to start on your assignment 201. Uh, one of the things that you will be graded on uh, in assignment 201 is whether the texture maps were applied correctly, the scale of the texture works correctly with the scale of your object. So you're going to need to figure out how to apply the mapping uh, and then also uh, figure out how to scale the mapping such that it feels realistic uh, for what it is that you're, you're creating. Uh, one other thing that I'll point out uh, that I didn't talk about is if you have just a plain surface something like that. You can apply texture just to that surface. Right? So I can go to whatever the surface is like that. And I can also choose to apply texture mapping to that particular surface. But I would use either a surface mapping if it has some undulations or a planar mapping, which basically means apply it straight down. The easiest way of conceptualizing that is you guys have seen like Google satellite photos. Right? If I were applying a satellite photo straight down because it's shot from above straight down, that application of color to the terrain would be a, uh, a planar mapping. Basically, take this and push it straight down. A surface mapping is going to wrap with the undulations a little bit more. Okay, And we'll cover that more when we get to the terrain section. Uh, but I at least wanted to point out that you can texture map just a plane surface as well. Yeah. when I did the texture mapping on this surface, it's on the bottom side as well. I don't know if it's going to let me see it because I need to turn off my infinite plane. This mouse is horrible. See, there it is on the bottom. So it will apply identically on the top and on the bottom of that particular material. Remember that this surface is infinitely thin as well. the inside of the vol volume would also have brick. So if I were to zoom in here, there's the back. You can kind of see it. I don't know. You guys can't see it. I can see it on mine. I can see the back side of the brick on those particular objects. Okay? So I just wanted to kind of go through some of that basic texture mapping. A lot of texture mapping is what looks right. So there aren't necessarily a right and wrong. There's not a formula. You just kind of play with the numbers and see what happens. Um, you do have the ability in any one of these to go in and edit the mapping. Um, so let's say you didn't like the rotation of this. You could adjust the UV or W rotation here. But a lot of it's an experimentation of, oh, let me try to rotate the, uh, let me do a brick surface here. right? Let me try to rotate this by 90 and see what happens. Now the brick's going the opposite direction. right? So it takes a little bit of practice to get used to what the rotations do. Uh, but generally, if it's in the vertical plane, you're going to rotate there uh, and get the eye go from there. Okay? So hopefully that was a good overview of texture mapping. We will cover more and more finer details. This was just meant to get you used to what's happening. Um, so I'm going to turn you loose to practice the texture mapping for part one uh, and then part two in terms of actually uh, rendering. And then we'll talk a little bit in a little bit about part three and part four um, and, and a few of the key pieces of that uh, in just a bit. Okay, so for part three and part four, uh, you're going to work with your objects that you created, the glass wall and the little concrete bridge. Uh, but I'm going to ask you to do one kind of a transformation uh, with them first. Uh, and that is on your bridge. Right, you'll have one that's saved as your bridge. So let me go ahead and make sure that I save this. Thank you for turning that off. 
Uh, let me call this bridge. And I'll go ahead and click save. Uh, and then I'm going to save this as, but before I do that, let me clean up my layer structure, right? Let's call this bridge. Let's make sure that there's nothing else here uh, so that we have it nice and clean, right? This is a simple object. There's not a lot of materials involved. The glass wall will be a little bit more complicated, right? So I have those. It's saved. Go to file save. And then I'm going to go to file save as, and I'm going to call this one ramp. And I'll click save. Perfect. And so I have this one as a ramp. Uh, and let's go ahead and rename this to be ramp. And what I'm going to do is what's called a cage edit. And we're going to cover cage editing a lot more a little bit later in the semester when we're dealing with complex surfaces. But for right now, I want you to be aware that it exists. I, I've created this object really nicely, but I want it to slope up um, from zero up. Uh, and so I'm going to do what's called a cage edit. And if I go up to my transform menu, I can then go to cage edit, or cage editing, cage edit. And I'm going to select my objects. I'll press enter when I'm done. My control object is just going to be a bounding box. Uh, it'll be world. And now this x, y, and z point count, we're going to change those to 2, 2, and 2. So I'll change the x point count to 2, the y point count to 2, and the z point count to 2. Okay. The rest of this doesn't matter. We'll talk about what that means a little bit later in the semester. But when I go ahead and hit enter, you'll see that I get a little box that shows up around my object. The region to edit is global. And then I'll ultimately end up with, see these little dots on the corners of my object? What this lets me do is it lets me take the back half of my object. Let me go ahead and select being really annoying and not. There, there there and there. I'm just holding down shift, right? Then I can type move and I want to move them vertically. Um, I should have said vertically. Move vertical three inches. And you'll see that now what was once flat is now sloping up for me. Does that make sense? Pretty easy transformation to make. Then I'll go ahead and save this. I'm going to go ahead and go to file, save. Alright, so now I have both the ramp and the bridge. And in a new Rhino file, I'm going to bring those in as blocks. Okay. Uh, oh, one thing I should do first. Let me go back and open that one one more time. Right. I should apply a material here rather than somewhere else. So let me go to, go to materials. I'll right click and say load material. I want to use concrete for this. You can use whatever material you want. Concrete. Let's do. Where's my board form? There it is. Rough board form. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to apply this to a layer. It's going to be the ramp layer. So I'll go ahead and say okay. And now if I were to preview this in rendered mode, we'd see kind of what it looks like. Looks like my texture mapping isn't right, so I'm going to go ahead and go through my texture mapping and make sure that that works. So I'll apply a box mapping to it. It'll be a bounding box, world, it is capped. Right? And I'll end up with my object here. Right? There's my little board form. If I want to make it a little bit denser, right? we could maybe go to 1.5, something like that. All right, so that works as this piece. I'll go ahead and say File, Save. And that's been applied. Uh, let me open my previous one, which was my um, bridge, and make sure that the material has been applied to this as well. Like that. Materials, and I'll go ahead and load. Perfect. I'm going to do my box map again. Bounding box, world, capped. This value was 1.5. Alright, if I go to rendered mode, we'll see it. Okay, looks pretty good to me. I'm happy. Let me go ahead and go to file save. Now I have both of those saved with the materials on their standalone file. Now in a brand new Rhino file, 
I'm going to bring them in as what's called a block reference. Uh, and Rhino uses blocks kind of the way AutoCAD uses XRefs. They're, they're synonymous uh, in, in the world of Rhino. Um, what we will be able to do though is we can bring in these objects and then we can go back and change our mind on the object and it will repopulate through our new drawing. So they're really, really useful when you start to have complex drawings. So I'm going to go to the edit menu and I'm going to go to blocks and then insert block instance. And I'm going to browse using this little file button here for my um, bridge. And it would be really helpful if I paid attention to where I saved it. Of course I didn't. Oh, how nice. It didn't stuck a folder. Go figure. Obviously I wasn't paying attention. There it is. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and bring in the bridge. I'll say open and I'll say OK. Now a couple things about it. When I go ahead and say OK, it's going to give me an option here. Uh, the important thing is to check embed and link as your option. What that's doing is, is putting the file itself inside your file. So if your original wasn't available, you'd still have the information. But it also keeps a, li a linked reference to your Rhino file such that if you updated your other one outside, it would populate back in. Uh, so we want to make sure it's embed and link, and we'll go ahead and say OK, and it will come in. And so I'll put it right now at 0, 0. And if I'm to look at this, it looks a lot like my object, but notice I can't select any of the individual pieces anymore. It's just one kind of grouped object, so to speak. Um, likewise, if I look at my layers, we can see that I brought in what's called a bridge layer. Okay. Now the one confusing thing that people do run into when they're dealing with blocks is that the block comes in on the layer that's currently active. So technically right now the block exists on the default layer. So if I turn off the default layer the block goes away. It also however exists on its original layer uh, or the objects of it exist on their original layer. So the, the block definition exists on some layer. So in reality uh, I really should have a layer that's called blocks and then I should have a sub layer for the bridge. right? And I can put my object here on the blocks layer. So let me change object layer. And now the blocks layer controls all of the blocks, the definitions, and the individual objects are still contained on their own layer. Okay, So I've adjusted the layer structure slightly to suit myself. Now I can go ahead and go to file, or excuse me, edit, import, uh, edit blocks, insert block instance, and I'm going to bring in Instead of the bridge this time, I'm going to bring in the ramp. Say OK. OK. Now notice it brings up this dialog box that says, do I want to use the existing material that's in the scene, because I'm using the same material for both, or do I want to replace it, right, or bring it in as a separate material? Uh, generally, I just use the existing material, or I replace it, either one, right? And then you can apply all. And then this will come in. Right, so if we're looking at that, notice that it slopes up different from this one that's straight. It also, there's a ramp layer, right? but it also put my object on the active layer, which was a mistake. So let me go ahead and select it, make sure that it ends up being on the blocks layer. And then I'm also going to make the ramp layer here a sub layer of blocks. Okay. So now that I've brought those in, let's move these together a little bit. So let me go ahead and move, and we'll go from here to there. Right, and let's copy and paste these. They work just like any other object. I can copy and paste them. And I went the wrong direction, sorry. Whoops. One, two, three. Let's try that one more time.
Okay, I can copy the straight piece here. Then I could take this part and I can mirror it. And I'd end up with a little bridge looking thing. Okay? So, the advantage here though is if I switch to rendered mode, right, all of the materials are going to be applied the same way, right, that I applied my materials. Okay? So, I can go ahead and I can save this. So, we'll go to File, Save. Right, and we'll call this assembled or something, I don't know. Uh, how about exercise 208? And I'll click save. Now, if I come in here and I say, ah, you know what, I don't really like how the seams are coming together, maybe I want to change that. Let me jump back to, we'll leave this one open. Let me go ahead and open that ramp drawing again. Or we'll start with the bridge drawing, I guess. All right, so there it is. Now let's say I didn't like that material. Let's go back to the materials and let me load a different material. And maybe I'll load the basic concrete. Say okay. I want to apply this to my layer, so let me apply material to layer. It'll be bridge. Say okay. And if we look at it, it looks a little different. Okay. Now if I save this, and I jump back to my original. There it is. And I go to Edit Blocks Block Manager. Right? You can see right here, Bridge, Linked File is Newer. Right? Let me go ahead and click Update. It's going to say one block updated successfully. And notice right here right, that my material changed. So the advantage is you can work on the small piece and have it populated into the big piece. So now, in this particular example, I also didn't chamfer the upper surface here. Um, so I could go back to my bridge, come in here, and I could say chamfer surface. Right, that was probably too much. Let me do this again here. Change this to 0.5. second I have to do a quick trim. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to do the other side. When I go to File, Save, and we jump back to my original, right, and I go to Edit, Blocks, Block Manager. Once again, linked file is newer. Go ahead and click Update. It's OK. And lo and behold, all of them now have the chamfered surfaces. So it's a really good way of, if you're going to repeat an object, being able to use them as a block really, really helps. right? So if I were modeling something, uh, for a design project or whatever, um, and I had a bunch of standard size windows in it, right? I would spend time, create a nice, detailed, good quality window, and then just repopulate it through the drawing. Does that make sense? Right? Furthermore, it lets you change it. If you want a different material, you don't like the fact that it was a wood sash and you want to change it to a metal sash, you can change the material and it'll populate all the way through. Uh, so using these blocks to your advantage is a really good idea. So what I'm going to ask you to do today uh, is to assemble this here, right, with some kind of a bridge, uh, bring in your little glass wall, put it behind, and do a little rendering for the end, okay, and you'll post that as well. So it's reinforcement of exactly what we're talking about with the materials, but it will also reinforce bringing in blocks uh, long term. We will continue to work with blocks as the class moves forward. We're going to start creating some detail blocks and then be able to use them and that sort of thing, okay? Any questions about blocks? No? Okay, good.